everybody, and welcome to Tea with Jesus for this week. Um, we're going to be continuing in Ephesians 6, um, talking about the armor of God, and I'm really enjoying this. I think there's so much wonderful, neat stuff to understand about the armor that the Lord is talking about here in Ephesians 6. Now, before we get started on that, I do have a little bit of something I want to show off. Um, I have a new teacup uh, to use with my tea. And uh, it's got such pretty roses on it. It looks so like, like a beautiful, lovely British tea time. But look at all the roses on the, on the little um, saucer. I just think it's lovely. So I want you to know that this will be, I just got it, this will be my very first time that I ever drink tea in this. I'm sharing it with you guys. looks wonderful. It's a nice constant comment tea with a little bit of stevia. Mm. All right, teacup, let's see how you do. Oh, pinky up. Oh, that's really lovely. So, it's like a little British garden. <laughs> okay, we'll get back, <laughs> get back to our scripture. Um, I just think it's neat how simple little things can just give you a lot of joy and how that there's so many just small things in this world that are quite lovely whether God directly created them or he made someone who was able to be creative um, we're made in God's image and our creativity is in God's image so someone did a beautiful job with I don't know recreating something as beautiful as a rose on these this little cup and saucer okay well here go the glasses so I can see this um the Bible that I have here, New King James, I really appreciate because it's got nice big words. <laughs> okay, now I am only going to be doing two verses this week, but there's so much in them that I just really wanted to give this a real chance. And so we're going to be doing Ephesians 6, verses 15 and 16 today. I'll go ahead and read them, and then we'll start talking about... Um, what's going on in these verses. Well, you know what? I'm going to back up a little bit and um, just start at verse 13 um, because I want to review very quickly what it is we're talking about. Um, this may be the first time someone's joining me on Tea with Jesus, and I want to make sure you know what I'm talking about here. Um, we covered two of the pieces of armor last week. That would be the girdle of truth and the breastplate of righteousness. But I'm going to go ahead and I think read 13 through 16, just to put it together. Verse 13, Therefore take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Oh, I love that scripture. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And those are the scriptures I'm going to be really looking at today. Um, so last week, we talked about the power in our life um, of truth and of righteousness, knowing we have the righteousness of Christ that has been given to us. We gave him our shame, our sin. He gave us his righteousness. So this week, let's look at this shoes on our feet. <laughs> the armor of having shot our feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now one of the things I love about this part of the armor is that it gives me a sense of of a Tra of traveling, of of going somewhere, and um, what it, what prepares us for that, and um, it, we want to understand that the word gospel basically, literally, just means good news. So when we talk about you know the the gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it's the good news of Jesus coming and of his life that have been been written down by those four men. So this says in verse 15, And having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. 
And um, that's something that, that, you know, the Bible says, how beautiful are the feet of them who bring good news. And um, I am going, I don't have that scripture here, but I'm going to look it up so that we can put that at the bottom when we put this in, um, when, we, when we put this uh, video out. Um, how beautiful are the feet of them who bring good news. And once again, talking about that, you know, uh, moving somewhere, going somewhere to share. Um, the preparation of the gospel of peace. Um, let's go to Isaiah 26, 3. And just talking a little bit more about the absolute peace that God can bring us. This is Isaiah 26, 3. You will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you, because he trusts in you. We're going to be talking about trust um, today, about the, the trust factor of faith. Um, I'm going to go ahead and read verse 4, too. Um, that's Isaiah 26, 4. Trust in the Lord forever, for in Yahweh, is that like the special name of God in the Bible, the Lord is everlasting strength. So when we keep our mind on Him and believing Him and knowing that He loves us and He's with us and that no matter how things look, His truth in our life has never changed, we will have peace. Uh, he will keep us in perfect peace. Mm. John 16, 33. This is when Jesus is talking to his disciples right before he was crucified. And he said, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. I really want to challenge you to just look at that scripture and think about these words and remember the truth of it. Um, Jesus was just encouraging them and they were living really rough times and they were going to encounter tribulation. Um, there's many people in the world right now that are encountering, encountering unbelievable tribulation. And the Lord, all down through these thousands of years, has been speaking this to us. These things I have spoken to you that in me, you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Jesus is the King of kings and the all-powerful Lord of lords. And he is the ultimate victor. He's the captain of the host of the winning, absolute winning side in the battle. And let's go to something I've shared about before, and I want to touch on it again. Philippians 4, 7. Another scripture I dearly love. I am going to read 6 and 7. Philippians 4, 6 and 7. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. We can have peace that has nothing to do with our circumstances because of the very presence of the Holy Spirit in our life, of God Himself in our life. And so what do we have that we can share, that we can be prepared to share? It's the good news of peace. And oh, man, do we live in a world that needs to know that they can have peace, even if their circumstances aren't immediately changed, even if we live in a pretty messed up world, we can have peace. And that is something that the Lord can 
keep in our life because He has the most power, because He is the conqueror, because He is the Lord. This is supernatural peace that doesn't make any sense, but we can have it no matter what's happening. And we can keep our mind on Him and believe Him and trust Him. And this is such a wonderful message that we have to share with others. That as we walk, we know the good news of peace. That's a wonderful thing. And now I'm going to read um, in verse 16. Above all, isn't that interesting? That's what he says right here. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And, you know, um, this. a lot of this is um, based around a basic Roman soldier's armor. And one of the things they would do, they would have these really thick leather shields, and they would often soak them and get them kind of drenched so that if someone was shooting burning arrows at them, if it hit the... Um, the shield, not only would it protect them from getting hit by the arrow, but the, the leather was wet and it would put out the fire. And that was just one of the things that they did with their, with their armor. And so when he spoke this, people would, would understand that. You know, they would have, have dealt with armor. And um, so it would quench the flaming arrows. Shield of faith. All of these different parts of the armor are so important. But I just think about having that shield strongly on our arm, out in front of us, which is faith. Let's look a little bit at faith. Let's, let's go to Romans 10, 17. Romans 10, 17. Such a basic truth, but let's really listen to it and let it soak in. It says in verse 17, So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Um, I think that a lot of times we end up in a situation where we hear people just talking about how wonderful faith is, but it's almost like they want to just have faith in faith. Um, so many times there'll be a song or somebody sing a wonderful lofty sentiment that if we would just believe, if we would just have faith, then everything can be okay. Um, well, faith is meaningless if you don't have faith in someone or faith in something. And um, our faith that gives us the strength that can be a shield for us is faith in someone. It's in God the Father, it's in Jesus the Son, it's in the Holy Spirit. It's in believing that they are strong and good, all-powerful and all-loving. And how in the world do we even get to know what God is like? Well, one of the really important ways is to see what He has said in His Word. The path that God has taken to preserve His Word throughout all of these thousands of years is extraordinary. Um, I could get into more of this later, but it is the most carefully preserved document that there has ever been in terms of an accurate, um, you know, accurately going down through the ages. God knew we needed to be able to have some way to know the truth about Him. And so He's given us His Word. And faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Um, let's go to Ephesians 2.8. And we were just going through this part, but I want to go back to it again. Ephesians 2, 8. It says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. And it goes on to say in verse 9, Not of works, lest anyone should boast. So, our faith leading to salvation, it, we have to know that that salvation is a gift. We're not going to ever be good enough to earn it. We need to accept it. We need to receive it. We need to believe it. We need to have faith in it. But we don't have to earn it. It's a gift. 
and then I want to go to Hebrews. Now there's a very famous chapter in Hebrews. It's very, very nice to read. But it's Hebrews 11, and it's often called the faith chapter. And it says in Hebrews 11, 1, Now faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And I don't, I don't want us to think we should just have faith in a happy ending or faith that things are going to turn out all right. We have to have faith in a loving, intelligent, incredible God who created us and knows us and has a wonderful plan for our life if we just give Him a chance. The faith has to be in Him. And then this chapter goes on for verse after verse talking about people through history that have pleased God because they believed Him, they trusted Him, they had faith in Him. And I don't want to read through the whole chapter, although I highly recommend Hebrews 11 to, for something to read when you're sitting down with the Word. But I do want to go ahead and read verses 32 through 40 in Hebrews 11. 32 through 40. Now he has been listing... The author here has been listing tons and tons of different people who really trusted God enough to just believe Him and do what He said and to see the outcome of what God, you know, to believe God for the outcome. And I also want to point out that there are people here that believed God for things that didn't see it happen in their lifetime. But God did ultimately bring it about. But they were just a part of God's plan and they had the joy of serving Him. And God ultimately did bring about everything that he promised. So let's start here in verse 32. And the, he's saying, What more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, or also of David and Samuel and the prophets. I mean, he just he can't take the time to go through every single one of them in depth and listen to the things that they were able to do through faith. Who through faith, subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trial of mockings and scourgings, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains, in dens and caves of the earth. And all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, they did not receive the promise. God having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. And there's just so many things that um, people were able to do and to go through with God's help because they believed and had faith in Him. And isn't that beautiful when it says that even though they did not receive all the promise, God was making sure that promise could be there for us too, so they would not be the only ones that were made perfect. And I'll guarantee you that as they're with the Lord, they're rejoicing in seeing how God has brought about His perfect plan through so many lives and through so many centuries. So, faith can be a very powerful thing when we're believing someone who is powerful and good and wise. There's a story um, that was apparently true um, about Niagara Falls. And, um, you know, for, for a while, um, people were trying to go over in barrels and everybody kept getting killed. I don't know if you've ever seen the Horseshoe Falls. I've been there. They are truly staggeringly powerful. Um, the water is so deep as it goes over the edge and so dark green and the, the cataract is so loud and powerful. And um, it's, a, it's an, an overwhelming sight in a lot of ways. And um, there was a man years ago 
but I think it's probably not legal anymore, but there was a man years ago that um, stretched a wire across Niagara Falls, and he was walking back and forth across the wire, and there was crowds of people there, and they were all like, oh, you know, and they, or they were amazed. And um, they kept cheering him, and I think they began to be pretty confident that he knew what he was doing because he seemed to be very successful with it. And so um, he got down off the wire and walked up to a crowd, and um, they cheered him and applauded and everything. And he said, he said, so you guys, um, you, well, he didn't say you guys, but however he spoke back then, he said, so you, you believe I can go back and forth across this wire? And they said, oh, yeah. He said, well, which one of you would like to go with me? And apparently you could have heard a pin drop. <laughs> and he had like a chair there that he could put kind of up on his shoulders. And he said, I'll take one of you across. He said, if you believe I can do this, then trust me. You know, have faith in me. I'll take you across the, water, the waterfall and back. Nobody said anything. And finally this girl spoke up. A younger girl spoke up. She goes, I'll go with you. So he said, okay, and you could hear the crowd murmuring and kind of upset and angry. And she got up on the, the, the contraption that he had on his shoulders. And he went out and he walked her across the wire, across the falls, and back again. And after the crowd kind of got over being really shook about the whole thing, they were, of course, cheering and applauding. Well, a reporter came up to the little girl and um, he, he said, what in the world made you be willing to do something like that is so dangerous. He said, well, why would you do that? And she looked up and she said, well, why? Because he's my daddy. And she had no doubt whatsoever that her daddy would take her safely across that wire and back again. And I think when we really know our Father in Heaven, when we really see how trustworthy He is, then we can have the faith to be able to listen to him and to trust that he knows what he's talking about. We can have that faith that will be like a shield in front of us. You see, we have to understand that there can be a kind of a big difference between saying we believe something and really trusting it. That crowd believed that that man could go across the wire, but that didn't mean they were willing to get a with him and go with him. Faith is trusting enough to climb up there and to go across that wire. It's, it's stepping out to say, I will trust you enough to do this. Like Peter stepping out on the water and realizing he could walk on the water. And um, so what that little girl had went beyond just some belief that would would be there for the people because he'd seen him do it she she knew it she knew she'd be safe enough to climb up on his shoulders to go across that wire then the scripture goes on to say with the shield of faith you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one that is Ephesians 6 16 above all taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. What what fiery darts are we talking about? What are some of the things that the enemy wants us to believe about ourselves, about our circumstances, about whether something has any hope? I mean, he started way back in the Garden of Eden when he was in the, the when he was tempting Eve. He started saying, are you sure that's really what God said? Are you sure that's really what he meant? Does he really want what's best for you? Wouldn't you be better off if you really knew what God knows about good and evil? Twisting God's words and trying to take away Eve's confidence that God really knew what was best for her. The Satan tells us that we, we are shameful, that we are hopeless, that we are unforgivable that our circumstances are terrifying, that it's all going to go bad. I can't believe all the horrible things sometimes that he really tries to make us believe. And it's like he's shooting these darts that are lit up on fire just to continue to try to wound us and make us uncertain and scared. 
Well, when we know God's truth about us, and we have faith in that, then that shield is up. And we can know that the accuser of the brethren, which is what the devil is often called, we can know that he is not right. He is a liar. He is the father of lies. And when we have things that happen in our life where we are losing something that seems really important to us or we lose someone we love or someone betrays us or leaves us or hurts us so badly or it becomes really scary with finances, becomes really scary with illness, it becomes a scary world. It just breaks my heart to see all the fear I even see in my own country. Um, and the enemy wants people to be afraid. He wants them to feel despairing and hopeless. And that is not God's truth for us. No matter how things look, even when people are being killed right now for their faith in Jesus, and it's happening, they have a glorious future. They are going to be able to be with the Lord. They're going to be wonderfully okay. There is nothing that the enemy or this messed up world or hurting hurtful people can ever do to us to take the Lord away from us or to take us out of his hand. And we will get through and we will be intact and strong. We have the shield. We can believe God. We do not have to accept the fiery darts. We can know that having done all that we can, we can stand in this wonderful armor of truth and righteousness and peace and faith and we are going to be okay. Let's pray. Lord, I really pray that for everyone who's listening that you're going to give them a place of peace and clarity where they can realize your truth about themselves. And they can realize that you will bring them through. That they don't just block out the clamoring, yelling of the enemy. And Lord, I pray that they will hear your voice. And in your word, they'll see the truth of who you are and what you want for them. And God, be with those that are suffering and lonely and hurting and scared. Give hope where it just seems hopeless, Lord, because you are our hope. And I don't care how things look, if we will just believe you and have faith and trust you and just hang on, it's you that's hanging on to us and that your peace will guard our heart and our minds. And God, just guide us step by step. But Lord, we know that when we've done our part, it's really your power at work. And we can stand in the light. And we can know that you are our victory. And you are ultimately going to be with us. And nothing that happens here in this world is ever going to really, really take away the total joy you have set before us, Lord, that you have for us. Please, Lord, I pray that people will see this and believe it. Please be with the lonely. And Lord, I just thank you for this chance to share your word. And God, be with those that are truly persecuted right now for their faith. God, give them peace and strength. And take them home to be with you if their lives are taken. And I know we can believe you for that, Lord. And I ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Love you guys, and um, we'll continue and finish up the armor next week. But please believe him and know that he's faithful and that um, he's the good guy. <laughs> All right, I'm going to get going. I love you, and we'll see you next week.